welcome for His Excellency, Ambassador Luis Almeida Sampaio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure and an honor uh, to be here uh, today for the very first time at the uh, Institute for Cultural Diplomacy to participate, uh, to participate, thank you very much, very kind, to participate in this uh, Berlin International uh, Economics uh, Congress. Uh, I am going to, to skip a, cap, a couple of the slides, not uh, because they are not good, they are outstanding, but because I really would like to go straight to a very important uh, topic. But, but before addressing what I uh, have to, to, to show to you, I would like uh, to tell you that we really need to, to think uh, in these times that we are living through about extremely important and essential things. And those things are sometimes very basic, uh, very difficult to grasp, but very easy to explain if you do it in a very vivid way. Uh, try try to, 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 to do uh, something that you normally do without reflecting on it. Uh, please take, take a deep breath, like that. Uh, I, I'm sure that you are all able to, to do it. If, if you would uh, like to repeat after me, take, take a deep breath. This, this is something that you would all agree that it is absolutely fundamental. It is absolutely essential. But it is exactly the type of thing that you only notice how important it is when you don't have it. Believe me, if you don't have it, you will immediately notice how important it is. It is like peace and security in Europe you only realize how important it is when you don't have it, like breathing. This is about Europe and about the European Union integration process. Europe is much more than money, is much more than economics, it's, it is much more than financial preoccupations. It is as important as this is about peace and security. That is the basis that promoted stability and development in our continent. So when we talk about Europe, when in Portugal people talk about the crisis, the European crisis, the crisis of the common currency, the euro crisis, they, more often than not, they confuse what is essential and what is not that essential. What is essential is that you keep focused on Europe, on European Union, on European Union integration on going on promoting for the generations to come what is really essential. Of course, we are living through a crisis, but put in the perspective I'm trying to put it, everything is relative and the crisis will fade away. The crisis in some years from now will fade away and uh, the essential things about Europe will remain. If you look at the example of, of my country, of Portugal, we are, as you know, living under a program of uh, adjustment, financial economic consolidation, and we are doing everything in a rather determined and committed way in order to abide by what we agreed with the international financial institutions, the so-called Troika. As you know, there is a heated debate in Portugal about uh, how is it living under the Troika supervision, and a lot of people on the streets, not only in Portugal, but also in other countries of Europe, 
they repeat loud and clear that they would like to get rid of the Troika, to get rid of the Troika as soon as possible. We, the Portuguese government, myself as the ambassador in Germany, we are in the very forefront of those that would like to get rid of the Troika. And the fastest way to get rid of the Troika is to abide by the commitments we took with the Troika, is to fulfill the program, is to be responsible and to do whatever it takes to curb public debt, to cut overspending, to improve and implement fiscal policies and discipline. And we are doing that in Portugal. We are doing that in a way that would even allow us to become, sooner than later, the beautiful small success story that the European Union needs to show that with seriousness it is possible to get rid of the Turkey and to come back to the market. But there is a indicator in everything that we have been doing in Portugal over the last two years, and we have still two years more to go before the end of the adjustment program, and we are doing everything, as I told you, reducing our public debt. Uh, it is already reduced by 53% in one year and a half of uh, uh, implementing the program. We are doing the reforms, the structural reforms, very much like the Agenda 2010 that allowed Germany to become very competitive in a global scale. And we are obviously doing whatever it takes to come back to the markets. But there is one indicator that derailed, one indicator that preoccupies us very much, and that was not, was not in our forecasts. And that indicator is the one that you can uh, see uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the chart, in the slide that I am showing you. You see the levels of unemployment in Portugal, they used to be extremely low, even extremely low by European Union standards, even by German standards. And if you look at the figures now, and they are still rising, because now it is almost 17% the average and almost 40% the use and employment, those figures, if you compare them with other figures, for instance, if you look, if you look at the youth unemployment in Europe, you would see that in Spain and in Greece the figures are even much higher than in Portugal. You could be tempted to say, oh, the figures for Portugal are relatively modest, relatively honorable. But we don't think that way, because we never experienced in Portugal such high levels of unemployment. We, ne we never experienced levels of unemployment, both average unemployment and especially youth unemployment, as big as these figures. Why is this so important for the European project? Why is this so important to keep alive the flame of peace, security, and stability that I mentioned at the very beginning of my conversation with you. It is important because this is about the future. This is the future. You cannot have the European dream fulfilled if you have these levels of youth and employment. And so we need, in a very serious way, to, to curb that. We need to find ways to come out of that. How can we do it? How can we use European solidarity? How can we use examples in other European countries to, to curb that? Part of the answer, but a very important part of that answer, is of course the professional training, 
the so-called dual system of education that you have here in, uh, in Germany. Th this is a very interesting uh, chart. If you look at it carefully, you would immediately see that the countries that have the lower rates of youth unemployment, they are very close to models of education that are based on vocational and professional training, the so-called dual system. Whereas, to the very contrary, if you look at the countries that are experiencing the highest levels of, an, of unemployment, youth unemployment, you will immediately see that they are in the framework of the countries that did not really promote vocational learning and professional training. So I am not pretending to, to say to, to a, a selected audience like yourselves in a Congress that is dealing with very serious economic problems. I don't pretend to say that this is the key and that if we adopt the dual system of education, we are going to get rid of those high figures of youth unemployment. What I am trying to say that this is worth looking very seriously at it. And we need really to reflect on the benefits of the system that is the German system of dual education. We all know that there is a lot of discussion about the system, even within OECD, with some rather ideological arguments, the system is very much criticized. One of the arguments uh, used very often is also a cultural argument, saying that the system of vocational training and dual education is good for Germany, is good for Austria, is good for Switzerland, even though Switzerland is outside of the European Union. Because it is good for a cultural pattern, a certain mindset that allows the system to fulfill its objectives. I dispute that. There are no, there should be no cultural boundaries when it comes to build the future, when it comes to fight against youth unemployment. And I would like to give it a try and to have the system implemented in Portugal to see the results and to see how it can contribute to curb youth unemployment. And we are doing it. We are not only talking about it. If you look at the system that exists now in Portugal, the educational system, I know it is not very easy to, to, to read, especially those small letters, but you can immediately see, looking at the very top of the chart, that in Portugal, now, until now, you can only have a PhD if you are inserted, included within the university academic system. It is not the case in Germany and the other countries that adapted the dual training of education, as you know. So, in Portugal, when the democratic revolution took place back in 74, only 5% of the Portuguese active population, only 5% had held university degrees. Now everybody has a university degree in Portugal because the revolution, the democratic revolution, created the fantasy that every Portuguese should go to the university and have a university degree, even though with the result of becoming unemployed. So the key curb unemployment is not to give people university degrees, is to give people jobs. We are developing the professional and technical education, educational path and we are following, following, adopting, but also adapting to our reality. We are not copying with a copy-paste uh, uh, technique, but we are adapting the dual German model to Portugal. We have been doing uh, 
uh, a lot in this regard. I am not going to bother you with details that are much more of interest to, to a Portuguese audience than to an international one. But what is important is, is that you know that we are implementing it and that it could be an example also for other countries experienced in Europe and outside Europe high levels of youth unemployment like ours. We signed already some uh, uh, MOUs on cooperation with Germany and with other countries that are also interested in exploring the success of the German model. Of course, this is easy in Europe, easier in Europe than elsewhere, exactly because of the important things that the European Union built as part of the European Union integration process. I am referring to the increased mobility across member states. Uh, it is extraordinary that we are living in a continent that experiences almost no borders. Again, it is something that is a wonder of our times and that people are becoming uh, more and more spoiled about it. If you travel by car between Madrid and Lisbon, because there are no geographical boundaries, as you probably know, the fact that Portugal is independent already for almost 1,000 years has nothing to do with, geog with geography, has only to do with political will, determination, and a very specific idiosyncrasy. There are no main rivers separating Portugal and Spain. There are no main mountains or big mountains. So, and if you don't speak Portuguese or Spanish well enough or good enough to notice the differences of the two languages, you could cross from Madrid to Lisbon by car without noticing that you were entering a different country. This is extraordinary about Europe. And again, that is, has to do, everything to do with mobility, multilingual and inter intercultural competency, com competencies in Europe. So it is only possible to adopt in full the model of mobility that would allow everyone of us to curb youth unemployment if we keep the European borders out. Again, as I said at the beginning, we are on track. We know what we have to do. We know what are the big concerns and preoccupations, but we claim that we can be that beautiful small success story in the southern rim of Europe that the European Union needs. Because the European Union does not need to go on piling up sad uh, stories. We need a beautiful, nice success story and my country can provide it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Ambassador Sampaio. We can take two questions, but please keep them focused. Anybody want to ask? Uh, I wanted to ask a quick question regarding how successful have you been so far? In, uh, in what concerns curbing youth unemployment, as I showed, we have not yet been successful. So it is obvious that the figures are rising. What we have are forecasts that point to curbing down youth unemployment. What we have been very successful so far is in all the other aspects of the adjustment program. We are really curbing the public debt, 53% already in a very short time frame. And the most important thing are the structural reforms that we are implementing. To give you only a very concrete example, but it is a very telling example, uh, the labor laws. The labor laws were put in force in Portugal after the democratic revolution in 1974. They were never changed until now. Meaning that uh, we did not need to touch them because of the structural funds coming from the European Union. 
that allowed us to create the needed infrastructures, but that were extremely detrimental in order to create a framework and an environment really competitive to face the challenges of the global economy. Now we are doing it. And a couple of months ago, you could see a chart again from OECD that would tell you that uh, the labor environment in Portugal was prone to rigidity and only the labor environment in Spain and France and Greece were even rigider than the Portuguese one. Now we have a labor environment that is more flexible and more in sync with the needs of competitiveness than the German labor environment. So we are doing it, we are delivering and we are going to witness the results in the very near future. Portugal is going to get back in the markets in 2013, full-fledgedly back in the markets, and we are going to end the program in 2014. That is uh, the expression of success. We will need to see in the medium run how we are going to curb the youth unemployment. Thank you. Last question. Yeah, first of all, thank you, thank you for your presentation. I am Alberto Aznar, I am from Spain, but I am working here at the, at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. And we have Portugal, we have Spain, and I have uh, other colleagues over there from Italy and from Greece. Then the best of Europe is, is here, the, the peaks. But I, I, want to, I want to ask you, because I, I, I was really happy with your presentations, because finally it seemed that, that someone is taking care about the job people of, of Europe. But I want to ask you what, what we can do to, to avoid this, uh, this problem, because uh, as you said, all of the people from Spain, from the job people from Spain, from Portugal, from Greece, from Italy, is coming to Germany, to United Kingdom to work. And what we can do, especially with this um, austerity policy that is, uh, is the main problem for countries, because we are not generating economy activity. Uh, as well, Spain and, and Portugal, Pasos Coelho and Mariano Rajoy are applying the, are, are taking a lot of care of this austerity policy, but what we can do to create uh, activity, economic activity, and then create the opportunities, create business, and create uh, employ for the, for the young people. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, that is obviously a very important question. There is one thing that uh, every single economist uh, agrees to. They disagree in everything, as you know, or in almost everything. You cannot find two economists that would agree to essential, on essential things. But there is one thing they all agree. You cannot have sustainable economic development if you don't have your finances in order. That applies to your home or to your country. It is exactly the same pattern. So to create economic sustainable development, and not, not to, to kick away the debt towards the future generations, which is a totally different thing. So to create real, serious, sustainable economic development, then does, will create jobs, you need to put your finances in order. We, we, we cannot reverse the priorities. And it is a fallacy if you believe that we could simply starting creating jobs and developing economically with our finances in a mess. We, we cannot do it. We did it. We did it for too long. And it takes a lot of courage to say it and to say, let's put our finances in order. It is not austerity for, it, for the sake of austerity or consolidation for the sake of consolidation. Nobody is pleased with the, those figures of youth and employment. Nobody is pleased with the hardship Nobody is insensitive to hardship. But again, you cannot have economic, sustainable growth without your finances in order. It is as simple as that. Thank you very much.